Well, we're going. Heaven knows where we are going. But we know within that we'll get there. Heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will. Come in and be here. Come into this place of hope. This place that dares to insist and persist in its belief of the transforming power of beloved community. Come into this place of faith. This place of trust. Come into this place of love. Now faith, hope, and love abide, but the greatest of these is love. Come into this place of courage, commitment, conviction. Come into this place of beauty. The reminder that the world is worth our efforts to save it. Come into this place of resolve, this place of steadfastness, this place of resistance. Come, come, let us worship together. You know, it's hard to know what exactly to say at a time like this. My colleague uh, Jake in Knoxville actually had... um, I thought a rather ingenious idea. He ended his service last Sunday by taking a congregational vote. He said, how many of you want me to vote about the election next Sunday, and how many of you don't? Or how many of you want me to to preach about the election next Sunday, and how many of you don't? And uh, it turned out that 97% of the congregation didn't want him to preach about the election, so, (laughs) so he's not this Sunday. In one church in the western part of our state, um, they seem to be facing this morning with distraction. Uh, They're holding a Muppet service. (laughs) One of my colleagues um, is is doing the service around spiritual practices that sustain and is leading her congregation in uh, laughing yoga this morning, while another of my colleagues is his facing today by staying the course. Every year on the first Sunday in November, they have their All Souls service, remembering those who have died, and they will not change that date. They're doing that this morning. And many, many colleagues, as I looked online, are preaching some variation of an election sermon, and that's what I'm going to give this morning. I actually want to go back to our history a little bit. I think our history informs, informs us, and so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about, about our history, and then I want to spend some time talking about today. Giving election sermons were, was actually a part of our history. The tradition began in New England in the 1630s and continued in one form or another until the 1880s, 250 years later. The tradition involved the Puritans and later the Unitarians, preaching to candidates and electors immediately preceding the casting of votes and the election of the political leaders of the Bay State. For part of this history, Election Day was actually the only holiday allowed by law in the colony. Election Day, the festivities would begin with a firing of a cannon and a procession of candidates and voters to church, where they would listen to a mandatory two-hour sermon. (laughs) Following that sermon, the election would take place, the new government officers would take their oaths of office, and the day would end with feasting as well as ample servings of beer, wine, and cider. It was an honor to give the election sermon, and through the years they were given by some of the most notable preachers in American history, the likes of Cotton Mather, Jonathan Edwards, and in 1830... The election sermon in Massachusetts was given by the Unitarian minister, William Ellery Channing. These sermons were were often published, and dozens of them have been preserved. In fact, a portion of Channing's Election Day sermon of 1830 is included in the back of our hymnal. Go figure. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not calling for the reinstitution of a mandatory two-hour-long sermon for everyone who seeks office or intends to vote. I think the tradition worked then in the colonial era because the population was rather small, lived uh, close together. The number of people who were actually allowed to vote was rather small, and um, everyone was pretty much the same religion, too. The Puritan church was the state church, and in a religiously diverse society, forcing everyone to attend a single church service before casting their ballots just wouldn't work. (laughs) 
It would be not only impractical, but also against our constitutional rights. However, I fantasize. I fantasize about forcing some people to have to listen to about two hours of me speaking my mind before they head to the polls. I've got some things I want to say. Unfortunately, or fortunately, you are not the people who need to hear what I have to say. But I do want to say a few words about the content, the content of those old Election Day sermons. It would be easy to think of them as fire and brimstone jeremiads of ministers warning that the world is going to hell and blaming the people in the pews for whatever is wrong because they're wrong-headed and wrong-hearted and inattentive to God's commandments. And if you read those sermons, that's how they tended to go a lot. And I think it's easy to emphasize the fire and brimstone <clears throat> aspect and de-emphasize the other aspects. The earlier election sermons tended to argue that government was instituted by God, but this argument, this argument was made in order to argue that the acts of government were accountable to higher moral standards. The earlier election sermons reminded those about to elect and those about to be elected that not only was God watching, but the world was watching as well. It was a stern warning about serious conduct, wisdom, probity, integrity, and virtue. Later election sermons in this tradition stressed character, extolled the use of reason, and sought to elucidate the virtues, habits, and qualities desired in our elected leaders. In a late election sermon in the 1850s, Unitarian minister James Freeman Clark reminded those about to take office, the difference between a politician and a statesman is that a politician thinks of the next election while a statesman thinks of the next generation. And today we might update that language to say a stateswoman. Now from time to time, these election sermons did include partisan jabs and naked appeals for political action. In particular, some sermons in the 1600s took aim at, took aim at certain Boston pubs, naming them by name and encouraging whoever is about to be elected to close those places down. But mostly, mostly those sermons, whether ancient or more contemporary, mostly they called for a stitching together of the fabric of society, reminding the listener about a social contract, calling everyone into a return to shared covenant, reminding people of their best selves, the better angels of their nature, as Lincoln put it. Now, obviously, I don't have that lofty bully pulpit that allows me two hours to address every eligible voter and every candidate were that it were the case. And come to think of it, come to think of it, having seen so many of you wearing your voting stickers around this past uh, couple of weeks, having seen so many of you post selfies from the polls, voting as families, it occurs to me that I'm largely addressing an audience this morning where probably 90% of you have already voted. But if I were, if I were to address a broader slice of the American electorate, here is what I might say. I'd probably tell some stories. I'd tell heart stories, stories that remind me of not only who I am, but, but, but who I would want for us to be. I'd probably first, I'd tell Yvonne's story. Let me tell you, I've been approaching, I'm approaching 15 years in the ministry. I've delivered over 500 sermons, but of all the sermons that I've ever given, none has been more meaningful to me than when I delivered in my last congregation when I told the life story of a member of my church, a young man named Ivan. Ivan was born in rural Mexico. As a teenager hoping for a better future, he took all the money that he had, traveled north, paid a smuggler, a coyote, to help him cross the Arizona border. 
He eventually arrived in the American med Midwest where he found work, like so many undocumented workers do, in the kitchens of America's restaurants, washing dishes and prepping food. Yvonne worked two full-time jobs, both at minimum wage. He'd work the breakfast and lunch shift at one restaurant, travel to the second restaurant, lock himself in a bathroom stall and take a 30-minute nap, and then wake up to work the evening shift. He earned enough to live in a cramped apartment and sent whatever he could back to Mexico to support his parents and his siblings there. While working at one of the restaurants he worked at, he met Sarah, a young woman whose family belonged to the church I served. Yvonne and Sarah fell in love and decided to marry. As Sarah pursued her education, Yvonne continued to work in restaurants. He had lived in the United States for more than a decade and had been married to Sarah for more than five years when Sarah became pregnant. The prospect of a baby on the way was a joy but also stressful, making him fear for his immigration status. He could continue to live as an undocumented, he could continue to live an undocumented life, which would restrict his labor opportunities, his, his earning power, and meant living in a constant cloud of fear and uncertainty that would hang over his life and the life of his wife and child. If he got deported, he would either have to leave his wife or child, and, or take them back to Mexico. Both of those choices were not acceptable. After consulting with an immigration attorney, he decided that what he would do was travel back to Mexico and begin an official process to come back to the United States, a process that might take three months or three years, a process that might not even succeed, resulting in a five-year travel ban from the country. They and their family and and their friends paid tens of thousands of dollars to an immigration attorney, assembled mountains of paperwork that included extensive physical and psychological and financial documentation, collected tes testimonies of 15 character witnesses. It's the minimum required. Those uh, character witnesses included mine as well as the testimony of a U.S. congressman. And then Yvonne returned to Mexico and waited. His story, I'm proud to say, had a happy ending. He was allowed to return with a pathway to citizenship, and he was actually able to return in time for his child to be born. But it could have been otherwise. His story turned out the way it did, largely due to chance and accident. It could have been otherwise, and more than anything, his story showcases our inhumane and broken immigration system. It showcases the fact that our economy requires millions upon millions of low-paid and unskilled workers, but our society denies those workers the legal, financial, and human rights that it affords to others. Our society, it's true, has always needed stolen and exploited labor. It was African slaves on plantations, Chinese immigrants brought to build the railroads, Irish and Italians and Poles to work the sweatshop factories in the north, Latinos to harvest the fruits and vegetables, forced labor in our prisons. But we know, we know it is inhumane, inhumane to break up families, to separate children from parents and spouses from each other. We know that the sane system is needed. I tell Yvonne's story. And I'd probably also tell Gary's story. Gary's a friend of mine. He's a Unitarian Universalist. And here's his story, which he gave me permission to tell. Gary uh, works as a trucker. For years, he drove a big rig as an over-the-road truck driver, those, those big 18-wheelers out on the highway. It's an industry where many drivers are considered owner-operators and benefits, when they're available at all, are priced so high as to be unaffordable. So Gary, like many in our country, went years and years without health coverage. In the fall, a number of years ago, Gary left his job driving on the highway because of stress and working conditions, and he pieced together a number of part-time gigs driving local delivery trucks, hoping to find a full-time position. And that December, he found what for him was a good deal. 
He signed on with a trucking company. He'd work part-time for 90 days without benefits. Then he'd move to full-time and would have another 90 days before the benefits started. And it was the uh, same week that he signed up for that, the same week that he signed up for that, that he began to have disturbing and distressing medical symptoms. He found himself in a situation that millions of others have faced, very sick, without health care. Fortunately for Gary, this was right after the Affordable, Air, the Affordable Care Act had launched. And he was able to sign up for insurance through that. That allowed him to seek medical care much sooner than he otherwise would have been able to, and it's a good thing that he did, because when he went into the doctor, it was discovered that he had stage 3 colon cancer. Had he waited a few more months, it would have been stage 4, and he would have had a 10% chance of living. Gary tells me, it's as simple as this, the Affordable Care Act saved my life. Without it, I would have died. And if I had two hours, I would continue telling you stories. Stories of friends, stories of people I know, from families I've ministered to, stories from strangers, stories that have been passed along across our increasingly digitally connected world. True stories, moving stories, stories of life and love and triumph and heartbreak and sacrifice, stories about gay and lesbian couples who can marry their life partner, stories of transgender people having the truth of who they are recognized and affirmed, stories of interfaith respect leading to healing and wholeness, tragic stories as well, stories of late-term pregnancies where something goes devastatingly wrong, but women and their families are able to pursue the safest option. Stories about black lives mattering and black votes mattering. I know you've already voted. I've already voted. And I bet you came this morning pretty sure that you know who I voted for. <laughs> and it may surprise you to hear that when I checked my ballot, I actually voted for Yvonne. I voted for Gary. I voted for Terry and Mark. I voted for Skyler. I voted for Tariq and Shazad. Voted for Ralph. Voted for Anne. Voted for Lydia. And I bet as you went to vote, you know who you voted for too. You know who you voted for too. It matters, my friends. I love you. Amen.